Hello and welcome. It is indeed a pleasure to see you all once again. Your presence here is indeed a credit to your courage and constitution. Down through the ages, sages and scholars of many sorts have advised vigorously against dabbling with and the conjuring of spirits. You see, you can never really be sure about exactly what it is you're communicating with. And in such a set of circumstances, it's almost never good. Our tale tonight is one such example of a vile entity, gone renegade in our world, and you may rest assured that its sole objective is your destruction. The title of our story is The White Demon, and fortunately for you, I've managed to contain it here on the Nightfall Radio Show. We all have darkness inside of us, the depth of which is determined by the measure of those things from which it was created. The darkness inside of my family is an abyss, and the screams that come from the other side of that darkness is an endless haunting inside my head. Everything I am about to tell you is true. It began with a dream, though a more appropriate description would be nightmare. I woke abruptly to the screams of children. Sweat beaded on my forehead, and I could feel my heart racing, feeling as if it would beat out of my chest. As I looked around the room, my eyes adjusting to the darkness, I could see my sister, Missy, five years my senior, in the other bed fast asleep. Why didn't the screams wake her, I wondered. Missy, in a loud whisper across the room, Missy, wake up. The words sounded muffled in my head like I was talking into a can. During my futile attempts to wake her, I caught a glimpse in my peripheral vision of a shadow moving past the doorway and down the hall on the second floor. Slowly, as if I were navigating an imaginary minefield, I crept to the doorway. As my bare feet left the soft rug and found the hardwood floor in the hallway, I saw the shadow leave the landing of the staircase and go down the stairs. I crept down the first six steps of the landing, peeking around the banister down the next flight of stairs. At the bottom, I saw the shadow and realized it was not a shadow at all, but more of a black mist. It had no shape, no features, but I knew it was staring at me. It moved without touching the floor, down around the corner of the stairs, and I followed. As I reached the first floor, I was very cautious and quick to move away from the living room, which was to the right of the staircase and into the den to the left. Pahu was in the living room resting on the piano. No one in our family, at least the kids, wanted anything to do with being in the same room with Pahu. His is a story for another time. As I rumbled into the den, I saw the thing on the other side of the glass pane swinging door that led into the dining room and kitchen, but the door had not moved. It was as if the black thing had gone through it. As I went into the dining room and to the left into the kitchen, I knew immediately where this thing was leading me, to the pantry, where there was a door to the basement. The wood door was very old and heavy with a skeleton key lock, always very cold to touch. I first found that out playing hide and seek with my cousins. Finding a great spot beneath the bottom counter of preserves my grandmother jarred by herself. I would lean my back against the door and notice how cold it felt against my shoulder, almost as if there was ice on the other side of it. Once, when Tommy, one of my cousins, found me and we let out a loud bit of laughter, my grandfather stormed into the pantry. "'What are you kids doing?' he shouted in his deep voice and his arms cocked by his side like he was ready to fight. "'Nothing, Grandpa. We're just playing hide-and-seek,' Tommy said. "'Did you try to open that door?' He peered into our eyes, assessing us for lying. No, sir, I said. It's locked. Yes, it is locked, he said fervently. And you kids are never to try to open that door. Do you understand me? Nodding, Tommy asked, Grandpa, what's down there? He turned back, and if looks were lasers, there would have been a hole in Tommy's head. Do you understand me? Yes, sir, was said back in chorus. He left us standing in the pantry with even more curiosity than before. As I entered the pantry, I could see that the door was open and the screaming was getting louder. It sounded like the screams of several kids who couldn't have been much older than me by the pitch of their sounds. I looked into the basement, 
down the stairs, and though it was black, there was a faint lightness below. I began down the steps, and the room was cold. With each step down, it got colder, and the screams became louder. When I reached the bottom of the staircase, I could make out nothing in the thick blackness. Out of nowhere, the face of a girl lunged at me. Not much older than me at ten, her eyes were wide, tears welling up around them. A look of panic on her face. Hair disheveled, her skin had a pallor about it that I had only seen at my great-grandmother's open casket funeral, when for the first time I had gazed upon a corpse. I felt her frigid hands touching, grasping for me, fingernails clawing at my cheek. It began to sting instantly. Jumping backward, I felt the hands of others reaching out of the darkness, pulling on my pajama shirt on one side, the other on my arm. These hands were cold and pale. The nails and fingertips were very dirty, as if they had been clawing at the earth. Perhaps it could have been dried blood, too difficult to tell in the dark. Then I felt another set of hands tugging at my pants leg, icy fingertips sliding down the cloth to the top of my bare feet. I could feel cool, damp concrete, the floor beneath me. Please, she pleaded, please make them stop. Please help us. She vanished as abruptly as she'd appeared, as if something snatched her back into the blackness. Desperate shrieking screams mixed with cries for help. Yet while I could not see anything, I knew they were all girls. I couldn't tell how many, but knew there were more than two or three by the number of different pleas uttered simultaneously. I knew at the very least four sets of hands had touched me. As I began to back up, I leaned over, stretching out my neck, as if that would help my vision cut through the darkness, and that was when I saw his face. Smooth as glass, white as snow, black circles around his eyes. I realized as I surveyed his face it was because they were sunken deep into the recesses of his head. His nose was long and had the slight pointedness to it. His eyes, a slight tint of yellow, where white should have been, no color to the iris. It was completely black, as black as the coal that Grandpa put in the stove in the mornings to take the chill off the den. His lips were nearly colorless, cracked and dry. Leaning over me, his sinister-looking grin revealed abnormally large teeth, appearing very sharp, like gazing at a yellow saw blade inside his foul mouth. I realized I was no longer in the cellar. Back in my bed on the second floor, this ghastly creature in my face leaned closer. The stench I could smell on his breath stunk of rotten meat. What I thought was smooth skin was actually covered with tiny scales. Raising a finger to his lips, it was long, crooked, slender, and also covered in scales. Puckering his parched lips, sound that emerged from them was deafening. Shh! It whistled through my mind. I knew a hideous creature was not telling me to hush as I remained silent in its presence. Instead, it was warning me to keep my mouth shut about what I had seen. It was a threat. Suddenly, the screaming in my head stopped abruptly and I sprang up in bed. My eyes adjusted to the darkness. I could see Missy still sleeping in her bed across the room. Daring to move, I went into the hallway, but only dim light from the bathroom illuminated the night. Listening, peering through shadows, awaiting the sounds of children I had seen in the cellar, I heard nothing. Back in my bed again, the light came on. Missy was standing beside me, leaning down over me, both hands on the bed. My sister was staring at me. What are you doing, Jimmy? Nothing, I said. I, I, I guess I just had a bad dream. Well, stop screaming before you wake everyone, she said. She leaned her head forward and squinted her eyes. What happened to your face? What? I asked as my hands went to my cheeks. Your face. You've got scratches. She reached out to trace the marks on my face, lightly touching the skin, then looked at me accusingly. Three claw marks on my face stung as the tips of my fingers found them. I... I must have scratched myself. Go back to sleep, Missy said as she went back to her bed, leaned over and turned the lamp off. Missy, I said, can we leave the light on? 
Oh my God, mumbling beneath her breath. She tugged on the chain of the lamp, dimly illuminating the bedroom. Before turning back, she said to me, Don't worry, he won't be back tonight. He? I thought to myself. He who? What the hell was she talking about? Had she seen the monster in the room? Was it real? My fingertips once again found the scratches on my face. They still stung to the touch. Missy, I whispered, no answer. Missy, I loudly breathed, but she was already fast asleep. I did not return to slumber that night. Instead, I propped my head up on the pillow so I could see the entire room and pulled the blanket all the way up to my chin as if to provide security from anything that would try to threaten me. Sleep eventually reclaimed me. It finally pulled me back, but it was not deep or peaceful. When I awoke the next morning, Missy was sitting on the side of her bed brushing her long, dark hair, as she did every morning. I was relieved. Everything looked normal around the room. A dream. I nervously laughed at myself. It was only a terrible dream. As I looked back to Missy, she put the brush down on the bedside table. Slowly walking towards me, her eyes squinted as if straining to see something. They're gone, she said. What? What's gone? I knew what she was talking about. The marks, she said. You were bleeding from scratches last night. The three marks on your cheek. They're gone. My hand went to my face. First one side, then the other. No stinging, no scratches. They were gone. You saw him, didn't you? Missy leaned toward me, spoke softly in a lighter voice as if others were listening outside of the room. What? My brow frowned. I was confused. How could she have known? What? Who? I felt dizzy. The room felt like the tilt-a-whirl at the state fair, and nausea was beginning to overcome me. I don't know. The white monster? Whatever he is, but he's not a man. But he's taken others there. Missy knew. My mouth opened, but I couldn't find any words to speak. Me. Jane. Brett. Terry. And I'm pretty sure Tommy. But he won't talk about it. We've all seen him, and we've all heard the girls screaming. They were cold, I blurted out. They were cold and pale, like Granny was at her funeral, and their hands were like ice, and they kept grabbing and tugging on me. What? You saw them? I don't think any of us have ever seen them, just heard them screaming. It was surreal what I was hearing from my sister, what I was recalling. There was no way that it could be real, but I knew that my dream was no dream at all. The white monster haunted us for years to come, and it was only later in life that we discovered who he was, what he was, what he was doing in the cellar, who the girls were, and what was causing their frightening screams. However, that is a story my family does not wish to tell. Unfortunately, I cannot claim that this was the last time any of us saw this demon in our sleep. And that concludes another excursion into the darkness on the Nightfall Radio Show. Thank you for listening to the program. The Nightfall Radio Show can be heard exclusively on the Blackwater Media YouTube channel. If you enjoy the show, please remember to like subscribe and share if you would like to submit a short story poem or artwork email your submission along with a brief bio to nightfall radio show at mail.com i'm your host dr william lester i'll see you again at nightfall <laughs>